Hardly a day goes by when we do not read news about food inflation. Rising prices in various parts of the world, countries in Africa are among the worst hit of course, but even countries like India or for that matter the United States and the United Kingdom are being strongly affected. Now the West's tendency has been to blame all this on Russia for the war and of course Russia has countered saying that it's a far more complicated picture. We'll be discussing all this and more on this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkaisa. Prabir, so uh, at the outset, uh, let's go straight into the issue in terms of uh, what the reasons for the food crisis are. We know that uh, Russia, Russia and Ukraine together, massive contribution to wheat exports. We know that Russia is a very important contributor to fertilizer exports. Again, sunflower oil from the region also, maybe one of the most important uh, exports. There are many countries whose primary imports are from uh, Russia and Ukraine. Now, the Western countries are saying that this is all because Russia started the war, it's blocked everything, it's a single reason for the food crisis. But is this really the truth? Could you just maybe take us to these narratives? Well, you know, there are two or three elements to this price rise that we are talking about. One is, of course, the sheer availability of food grains. If the food grains do not come into the market, the price is going to rise. The rich countries can still buy, even if they have a food inflation in their home countries, like the European Union, United Kingdom. But at the same time, their ability to then buy at a higher price is more than that of the poor countries. So that's one element of it, which is we are seeing that there is less food in the market or food grains in the market. And therefore we are seeing a price rise. And that price rise, of course, is affecting countries uh, completely in a different way, depending on their purchasing power. And what you've talked about, particularly for Africa and uh, West Asia, the other part of it is they're highly dependent on Russian and Ukrainian wheat, particularly Russian wheat. And therefore they, if the wheat doesn't come into the market or it's not accessible to them, they're, they're going to see a problem of how to feed their people. So that is one part of it. Of course, there's a larger picture which I'm not going into, the structural imbalance where people have shifted more to uh, export crops than food grains. And right. this is what has happened under the IMF, World Bank, policies for quite some time. I'm not getting into that at the moment, just looking at what the immediate causes are. The argument that is being given is Russia is blockading Ukraine's uh, wheat exports. And the key issue here is Odessa. Now, the other part of the story, which you don't get to hear from the Western media uh, reports, is that Ukraine has mined the port, Odessa port, so the you, uh, Russian Navy cannot approach Odessa from the sea. Now, if it is mined, and there are about 50, 60 ships already stuck in the Odessa port, which cannot leave, it is not because there is a naval blockade, but there are also mines. So the question is, how do you negotiate export from Ukraine using the Odessa port? Any other form of exports using rail or using, for instance, trucks, the quantities are too huge for it to be moved from Ukraine and to other countries. And there's an additional problem, they're more moved by rail, then the, the rail lines in Ukraine uh, can reach the port provided the go via Belarus without changing uh, or unloading the wheat and again loading another train because of the railway gauges in Western Europe or in some parts of Eastern Europe like Poland are different from that that is being used in Ukraine. And the right. only access they have then is through Estonia, I think, but it is through Belarus, which is also something which is at war with Ukraine. So given this, that it is not, there doesn't seem to be any other solution but to allow exports from Ukraine, Ukraine by Odessa. And Ukraine has to agree, therefore, to demine the harbor. And this is something Turkey has proposed to be the uh, middle, per, middle guy in that sense, talk it over with both and see whether Russia agrees, which it has, and whether Ukraine will agree. Ukraine has said, no, we're not agreeing, because if we demine, then of course, Russian Navy can come in again, and we don't trust them. So that is the deadlock over Ukrainian exports. It's not so much of a Russian blockade as the US would claim, but they will say the cause is the war, that's all. And then if the cause is the war, Russia will turn around and say the cause is the NATO expansion and we get into what would be the infinite regress of who caused what. But right. the proximate cause, the immediate cause is that Ukraine is not allowing the export of Ukrainian wheat. 
And therefore, that is one of the problems that they, we are facing. The second, of course, is Russia. Russia, as you have said, is in fact a bigger exporter of wheat than Ukraine is. And it's one of the bigger suppliers in the region that we are talking about, which is West Asia and North Africa, particularly. Here, the problem that is there is the Russian ships are being sanctioned. They say, we have not sanctioned wheat. Yes, that is correct. They have not sanctioned wheat, but they have sanctioned essentially export through sh Russian ships, no insurance. And if you don't get insurance, you can't export, you can't, your ships can't go anywhere. And they've also barred access to a number of ports for Russian ships. Uh -huh. So other ships cannot be used because they need essentially the banking channels, the ability to transact business. They, the Western or large number of international shipping companies would need access to Russian bank transactions, which because of the SWIFT uh, ban and various bans on the Russian banks, that is going to be difficult. So you have the financial sanctions and the insurance sanctions, which are a part of the sixth tranche now hitting Russia and therefore also hitting its exports of wheat. Now, Russia is not that dependent on income above from wheat exports because after all, European Union is still forced to buy gas and oil from Russia. Right. Given that as a scenario, and this is going to continue, the oil sanctions are only going to hit after six months. They don't have an immediate problem. In fact, they're making more money from exports today than they were earlier. It's about six to $10 billion is their additional income from exports per month at the moment. So they're not feeling a pinch on that. But the problem is then wheat, how does it get go to other countries? And the, where are the ships? Where is the insurance? And how does Russia then negotiate new insurance to cover the risks of war, which is what now it could be argued is, and how do the other uh, ports, countries now negotiate the transaction of wheat? That's the main issue. And unfortunately on that, the blanket assertions, what you get is really blanket assertions from the West. No, no, Russia is the culprit. All right. of it is Russia's fault and no attempt to address the questions with the African Union as well. Maki Sal, who was recently in this conversation with Ukraine discussing how to export wheat from Russia. No attempt to address the problem they're raising. While at the moment, we could be seeing food grain prices and the rate it is rising, it is 60 to 80% higher than last year, and it could reach 100% more. And at that cost, we're going to see large scale starvation and much faster increase in poverty across Africa, as well as, for instance, South Asia, where also the prices of food grains are rising, maybe rising due to different reasons, not the question of the import and export directly, but the prices are rising here. We have an 8% per month food inflation right now in the country. So all of this is really playing out in a way that's going to see a huge increase in starvation, malnutrition, and particularly affecting the most vulnerable, the children, the women, all over the world, particularly in Africa and large parts of West Asia, as well as other, other parts of the world. Absolutely. And Prabir, finally, very quickly, like you said, does this also demonstrate the complete failure of international organizations or fora in this regard? Because we're seeing a global food crisis, like you said, African Union leaders, they were in uh, Russia, they, were, they took a stance against sanctions against Russia as well. But there seems to be no forum where countries can come together or influence, uh, even on a matter as important as food. Yeah, I think that's a bigger issue that can we have a restructuring the world trade in a way that countries are able then to handle the fact that they have not imposed sanctions. But if Europe, Western Europe and United States imposes sanctions, the financial system and the services systems, uh, financial services like insurance, for example, all of these become very difficult for others to handle. So it's a handful of Western countries who are, the, who are in this sanctions as war mode. They say right. Ukraine war is Russia. We are doing sanctions that is not war. We're just trying to teach Russia a lesson. 
so that they don't do this again. Of course, who's going to teach any lessons for them when they invade Iraq or they invade Afghanistan or uh, Libya? Oh, those questions, of course, are not to be raised because as you know, uh, these are not democracies. Only countries that America approves are democracies as we've seen in, for instance, in Latin America right now. But leaving that out, there is another issue, I think, which we need to touch upon, which is the issue of fertilizers. Now, you mm -hmm. know, food is, of course, an immediate crisis. Right. But the fertilizers is the other part, which is a bigger long-term crisis because your food output will drop precipitately, particularly across a huge arc of the world where they cannot get access to fertilizers from Belarus and uh, Russia. And mm -hmm. these are phosphatic fertilizers uh, the diammonium phosphate, DAP as it is uh, called widely. Now those, those are critical to, for instance, Indian agriculture, Asian agriculture, African agriculture, who import large amounts of uh, the fertilizers from Belarus and Russia, who are very big suppliers in the international market. If that drops out of the market, prices again of fertilizers go up, but the effect of all of this is going to be much larger on the output of agriculture for the future as well, is we are talking of so not something for a month or two months, you're really talking about a year down the line. And you are also talking about the other input, which is oil, which right. is diesel, which is used in agriculture widely. So all of these are having indirect effect on agriculture. But the issue that you have raised is how do, do countries now who are not interested in sanctions, who want trade with Russia, with Belarus, for their survival, how do they negotiate a scenario where the West seems to have a disproportionate advantage in the ability to inflict a whole range of sanctions which are extraterritorial? It is between trade between Russia and Africa. So it is not that they are imposing sanctions about what they are importing or what they are exporting. That's not what Europe or the United States is doing. It is actually sanctioning trade between Africa and uh, Russia, for example. And that's because of the financial sanctions, which are extraterritorial, which are in that sense, in the larger sense of the word, undeclared economic war. And as number of uh, jurists have said, this is, this is really a part of war. And as you know, this kind of war is, you know, international war, undeclared international war, of course, has a huge implications on international law. But I'm not getting into that issue. The issue that you're raising is, how do we restructure international trade in a way that countries can transact business directly, which means the ability to pay each other, which is finally comes down to the currency war that we have talked about. Russia has recovered out of the currency war. The ruble is trading much stronger than it did for the last two, three years. But right. what about other countries? And what happens to their currencies in a condition where that currency cannot buy as much in the market due to price rise? So all of this is the really the trade war, the economic war, that is what is a key issue today. And can we get to a world system where the trade between countries is not affected by third countries imposing sanctions, which is in this case, a handful of Western countries, including the United States, Australia, Canada, and of course, the European Union. So I think this is the key issue and how it will play out. Will it play out in weakening of the uh, countries, Western European countries and the uh, United States, or will it lead to weakening of Russia in the long run? It's something that we have to ob ob observe carefully. But as we have been talking about, there have been financial analysts who said that increasingly currency will be pegged to a bunch of commodities. And right. in that, those who are doing the primary commodities export or commodities of finished goods certainly will have an advantage over those who are doing invisible exports of services or financial instruments, uh, extracting money from financial instruments, or from, for instance, even about from, say, entertainment and software. After all, you know, you can stop eating, seeing Netflix, but you can't stop eating. So there is this issue that comes up. How do you tag on your currencies to what? And I think increasingly this is going to become an issue that uh, dollar and euro 
being the de facto global currency's particular dollar, that is going to come into question if this, this particular economic war continues, which it is shows at least no sign of abating. I'm not sure even if there is a ceasefire in Ukraine, this would really take place. So as we see the war in Ukraine, the economic war, the undeclared war having a drastic impact uh, on not only on international politics, but also on our wallets across the world. We'll be tracking many such issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.